There are a lot of things that I think you can change if enough people are informed and organized and focused. But not everything can change the way you might hope that it can. In my head, I divide them into dogs and bears. See, dogs you can train, and even over time even breed, to be either killers or to not hurt a fly. A bear, well, you could try, but I don't think it's possible to simply train the violence out of a bear. Culture is a dog. Culture, simply put, is the widespread beliefs and assumptions of a group and how people act on them. Culture can change, because culture has no inherent purpose. It can become more or less warlike, or open-minded over time, or maybe even wiser. But just like I can't train a grizzly to ride the subway without hurting anyone, you can't turn the state into a humanitarian institution that secures everyone's rights and freedom. That's not in its nature. If you try to humanize and defang the state, you'll get mauled. I've explained in a number of other videos how the state works, and in my second video on this channel I explained why even voting is a big waste of time. Um, and, in fact, these videos are on the same playlist as this one, so you might have just watched them, and if not, you can find the link in the description. The TLDR version is, the state has never existed to serve you and me. It creates and serves a ruling class and you can't make it work any other way. It exists to use violence on behalf of the rich to help them get richer, and keeps us down when we try to fight back. When you look at the state's history and what it really does beyond the propaganda, you'll see there's no democracy, and that your so-called rights and freedoms can be taken away at any time. Many people who plan to run for office do so under the illusions the state has planted in their minds over their lives. Namely, the system represents and responds to citizens, so running for office is how you change things. The bear just needs the right trainer. I made a mistake like that once. Thirteen years ago, I got married. Then, a couple of years later, I got divorced. Why? Well, there are lots of possible reasons we could spend hours analyzing, but what they boil down to is, I didn't know what I was getting into. I hadn't thought much about marriage, except that, like everyone else around me, by default, I was going to get married someday. So I fell in love and got married. But marriage is more than just love. There's work, there's sacrifice, there's arguments and compromises, there's kids and houses and retirements. If you don't have the right partner for those things, gonna have a bad time. Point is, having failed to think critically about my decision before I made it, I made a major life blunder. You, considering running for public office, are probably making a similar mistake. To start with, let go of all the propaganda you've heard about what the state supposedly does and why. If you believe in democracy, you're barking up the wrong tree. In politics, you'll hear all manner of rhetoric about making democracy work or whatever, but it's just rhetoric designed to trick people into participating. It calls itself an open and competitive system where anyone can join, but it isn't, is it? Because you need to fill out a million forms, pay an endless number of fees, and follow a bunch of rules designed to make it hard for you to join the race. As a result, most people don't have the money to run for office, so they have to get it from somewhere else. So where does your campaign money come from? You have two basic choices. You can get your money from rich donors, who tend to be really conservative and just want you to 
keep the system working the way it does, so that's what you'll be doing in office, keeping the system working for the rich. Alternatively, you can get your money from small donors, you know, working people who don't have a lot of money, but who've been inspired into hoping their preferred candidate will win and do something for them. So you can take their money. It takes tens or really hundreds of thousands of dollars to stand for election, including employing an office full of staff. People never take into account the opportunity cost of this kind of action. If you run for office in the hopes of representing these people, you're starting by taking their money and time. Is there no more direct way those things could be spent to improve the community? After all, how do you plan on serving the people by serving the state? They're in an antagonistic relationship. The people want things like freedom and prosperity, while the state exists to take those things away. Let's say you win the election and go to Congress or Parliament or l'Assemblée Nationale. What, are you going to be the lone voice speaking truth to power while unable to stop it? Do you dream of voting some way or introducing some bill that makes some kind of lasting, positive change? You might be under the impression you'll be able to vote with your conscience, but that's pretty unlikely. Politics is about coalition building and horse trading, which is like, you vote for the bill I want to pass and I'll vote for the bill you want to pass. You would probably have to compromise any principles you ever believed in in your first week on Capitol Hill. Moreover, if you really wanted power, you wouldn't want to stay a backbencher. You want to get into committees and cabinets and stuff where more important decisions are made and legislation is drafted. But how do you get onto those committees? You have to show loyalty to the people who run them and show you can do something for them. So that's another bunch of time and votes you'll be lending to legislation that isn't in your constituents' interest. The system resists even the most moderate of changes. You might have all kinds of ideas about good changes you'd like to make, but politics is controlled by interest groups. Which of them do you want to anger? Or did you actually take that all stakeholders must work together stuff seriously? There's plenty of money going to subsidize big business directly. I don't want to say also indirectly because all of government is an indirect subsidy to big business. So, but, but a lot of them are direct subsidies. Something like a hundred billion dollars from, from the budget every year in the U.S.? So obviously we should cut those subsidies, right? <laughs> but how? Who are you going to get to vote for your Take Money Away From Our Campaign Contributors Act? Or we could let some people out of jail and take measures to prevent so many people from getting locked up, right? But only if we can get it past the police and prison guard lobbies, who are stronger than any politician. You'd quickly find any budget cuts or repealing of laws you would consider obvious would anger people whose support you would not be willing to lose. Each time you compromise your principles, it gets easier. That's what people mean when they say power corrupts. You don't have to justify as much to your conscience each time. Maybe telling yourself you have to do these things to accumulate enough power to help people. I have to do all these things for the rich if I want to do anything for the poor. Then when you finally submit your empower the poor bill, it'll get so watered down in committee or in implementation by bureaucrats, you can't be sure it'll help anyone but at least you'll have some nice sounding legislation to make you look good on the news. By then, that's all that'll matter. As a politician, you'll need to vote on a lot of legislation over time. Some of it will disgust you and most of it you will never even read, but you'll still need to vote for it if you want any influence. And regardless of what you actually think, you'll still need to justify everything to your constituents in rosy terms. 
You can't just say, well, I had to vote that way or they wouldn't have supported me on the bill I really want to pass because it makes you sound spineless. Instead, you have to say, it was a tough decision, but I had to follow my principles and do the right thing for my constituents. <sighs> Political propaganda is so easy to write. Because regardless of your intentions, politics is a dirty game in which each participant pretends to be a cleaner. One of the main arguments radicals give for running for office is at least they'll get the bully pulpit. If you're up for election, you get a bit of time in front of the camera, so in theory you can talk about how bad the system is or how to solve problems, right? Culture, remember, is a dog, so it can be trained. So anyone with a platform can educate the public. But who are you trying to reach? Most people who pay attention to politics do so because they want to think they're participating, because they believe in the system as firmly as they believe the sky is blue. They aren't interested in some upstart with new ideas. I like YouTube or Facebook or podcasts as platforms, personally, because this way, most, mostly just people who are interested in these questions will seek out and watch these videos. My audience has some idea what to expect. And the things I talk about take time to explain, so I need a platform where I'm not continually interrupted. Besides, I'm not an expert debater. I might be right, but still lose the debate miserably and look like a fool. I think I would spend most of a candidate's debate just saying, Oh, that's just propaganda. The media give you a couple of sound bites, and they might not be of the points you wanted to make. Although usually they won't even give you that much. If you're not well known, or they don't like your message, they'll ignore you. How many people can you name from anywhere or any time who were ever on a ballot who received fewer than, say, 10,000 votes? Can you remember anything they said? Didn't they have the bully pulpit too? So the question becomes, do you have the resources to mount a big enough campaign, to get a big enough pulpit, to make a big enough speech, to change enough people's thinking for it to be worth it? And if you do have the resources for that, why run for office? Why not just go around speaking? Why not go around speaking and organizing people like Malcolm X did? But that's the other problem with running for office. It becomes all about you. As a politician, you're always building your own brand in order to get elected and re-elected. So you become the center of everything. And the issues take a backseat to photo ops, sound bites, scandals, and what you're wearing to the Met Gala. So yes, you could take thousands or millions of dollars and a full staff out of the community to take a position ruling over them in order to educate them. You could live off and distance yourself from the people in order to serve the system that oppresses them. You could take the most indirect and unsure path available to solving problems. You could reinforce the propaganda myths that you can change something through the system because it's an open and representative system and we should continue to try to change it. You could. Or... You could work with the community you wanted to serve in the first place, educating people, analyzing the nature of your problems together, and solving them head on. When I say the community, I just mean the people around you. It doesn't have to be your neighbors. It could mean your workplace or just anyone you can find who's interested in changing things. You might need to go through a long process of discovery of what the real problems are and how to solve them, followed by setting goals and making plans to achieve your goals. You might need to learn how to organize democratically without hierarchy. But it'll save you the time, money, and effort you would otherwise have spent trying to tame the bear. 
If you want power in order to solve problems, empower the community and any radical movements it's produced. That way, instead of accumulating personal power that you'll use to help the rich get richer, you produce community power, democratic power that can challenge the power of predators like corporations and the state. Thanks.